Hello, my name is Sam Sloan. I'm a candidate for President of the United States. I speak about 15 languages, some of them more fluently than others, but I can basically get along in, in, a, in about 15 languages. One or two of them I've, I've basically forgotten. I used to be able to speak, but I can't remember much of them anymore as my travels around the world. Of course, I speak Spanish. Yo puedo hablar español muy bien. I speak another language which is spoken in northwest Pakistan called Kowar. And, and uh, for example, the sentence in Kowar, Ma tabiat jam sher. Ma tabiat jam sher means I, I am in a good mood. That's what it means. In Kowar, Bo tez mo joe tasabir. Or shang shang mo boss tasabir. Or my wife's favorite expression was, I shouldn't say this in public, but you won't know what it means anyway, is uh, tanar zug. That's the, that's the thing she used to say all the time. So I know this language called Kowar, which is spoken in Chitral. That's actually my best language outside of English. I speak Pashto. I speak Delta Kena, Delta Larsha, sit down, go here. Yao Dwa Dres, Lars Penza, Shpawa Tana Las. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pashto is a language spoken as a majority population of Afghanistan. It's also spoken in Northwest Pakistan. Uh, I must tell you why I've known Pashto. Uh, very, very few Americans. I'm just about the only one that can speak Pashto. Uh, the reason was I was in jail in Afghanistan. Uh, one of my adventures, I wound up being arrested as a spy in Afghanistan. I was in jail for three months. I was locked up with a bunch of Pashto speakers, so naturally I had to learn a language, so I learned this language. Um, I'll give you a few examples. For example, Sugoram da Injili Wugayum. Now, this is a very important e expression in, in Pashto. I'm not going to tell you what it means. If you're a Pashto speaker, you know I said something rather surprising. And, but, but you will be able to recognize just by me saying this particular thing that, that I really can speak Pashto. But the simple things like Yao Dwa Dres Salor Pinza Shpa Wata Na Las, Yao Las Dwa Las Dres Salor Pinza Las, or Delta Kena Delta Larsha, you know, uh, things like that. Um, uh, you know, I can, I can get along pretty well in Pashto. Uh, same with Afghan Farsi, which is called Dari. It, it, it's ektu tin char pan after da or pasmiram or there are a lot of expressions that, that I know in uh, Afghan Farsi. German, of course, I speak German. You know, the uh, Universität uh, München findet sich ein Zimmer in der Stadt. That means the University of Munich. There's a, there's only one. Uh, everybody finds their own uh, how, room in the city. Hungarian. I speak some. I I was living with the Polgar sisters for for several months. And and etu uh, karm I I can basically uh, get along in chess chess uh, Hungarian, uh, uh, Arabic I can say That means after three days, and that's when they when you apply for anything in uh, Arabic country they always say All right, come back in three days. Of course you come back in three days and they say again another three days. Russian I can get along fairly well. Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> Govrit uh, Paruski, you know, a few things in Russian. Uh, Hindi and Urdu, uh, well, they're both really the same language, they just have a different ri writing system. Ecto, Teen Charpans, you know, and, and then in Japanese, I, uh, I get along with Japanese too. It's, I'm not 100% fluent. Of course, my, my, uh, my former wife is Japanese, but Konichiwa, of course, and Ikura Deska, and Arigato Gosayamaska, Ichine Shanshi Go, Roku Ichi Achiku Q, Chinese. Um, Again, um, I, I'm a top player of Chinese chess, so I can I can more or less get along in Chinese. E er san si wu liu chi ba ju shu. I can also speak a language called Uyghur. Uyghur is spoken in far western Xinjiang province of China. Things like bir yu jat mit besh. Bir yu, you probably uh, you probably recognize that it's similar to uh, to, to Turkish. Yakshima Yakshima says, I was the first person to go to um, to Kashgar. Uh, first foreigner to go to Afkashkar. In January of 1985, uh, I'd written, I read a, something about the history of Kashgar, and in January 1985, it was in, an, I happened to be in China at the time, and it was published in the newspapers in China that Kashgar is now an open city and foreigners are allowed to go there, so I immediately got on a bus, cross-country bus. It took me four days across the desert uh, to reach Kashgar, and I was the first foreigner to get there, and the reason I know that is because they had only one hotel all the foreigners were required to stay at this one hotel, that, which they had just built. They had just finished building this hotel for the influx of, of tourists that were going to come when they opened up the city, and I was the first guest there. So I can say that, uh, and it's been verified, that I was the first foreigner ever to visit Kashgar because after the, after the uh, Yurkan Commission that went to Kashgar in 1880, in 1880, uh, the British sent a delegation to Kashgar 
and, 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 and established diplomatic relations with Kashgar, but only three years later, the Chinese uh, didn't like that, so the Chinese uh, conquered Kashgar, killed the ruler, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, Yadgar Beg was the ruler of Kashgar. The Chinese killed him and took over Kashgar, so no foreigner ever entered Kashgar from 1888 up until 1985, when Sam Sloan Mee was the first foreigner ever to go to Kashgar in, in that 100-year period. And the last language I speak is Kalashwar, which is Spatabaya. I'm actually publishing a book on Kalashwar right now. That is spoken by a rare tribe called the Kalash in the, um, in the northwestern portion of Pakistan uh, in, in Chitral. They, they, ha they have a, a tribe, uh, a tribe of uh, indigenous tribe of, of, of people who, who do not, are not Muslims and they're not Christians or anything else. They have their own religion, which is about 4,000 years old at least. And they, they have their own gods and goddesses. And when a person dies, they don't bury, bury their dead. They put them in a coffin on top of the ground. And if a prominent man dies, they dance around his dead body for 48 hours. And if a, and if a child dies, they dance around her dead body for 12 hours. Um, and um, they don't bury their dead. They put them on top of the ground. And, and by the way, if you want to marry a girl, a Kashgar girl, if you ever want to go there and marry one, what you have to do is you have to pay her original husband double. Now, for example, if the first husband uh, paid one goat to get married, because in, in all Middle Eastern countries, when you get married, either the man has to pay money to the woman or the family of the woman has to pay money to the man. It, it's a, there's always some financial compensation, regardless of, of where it is in the Middle East. There's always a financial compensation for getting married. Sometimes the man has to pay money for the woman or sometimes the woman has to pay money for the man, but there's always some exchange. So if you marry a Kalash girl, if her hus first husband paid one goat to marry her, then you have to pay two goats to the first husband. Another guy comes along, he wants to marry this girl too. So now he's got to pay four goats to you. And then the next person comes along and he's got, that, that next person's got to pay eight goats. So it keeps doubling along. So some of these, some of these marriages become very expensive because you double so many times. And if they get really, really expensive, then you have to pay a cow, you know, because I'm not sure how many goats are, are equivalent to a cow, but, but, uh, but anyway, that's where it gets to be really expensive getting married over there.